So we're here at uh, Portland Retro Gaming Expo 2018, of course, with Dan Kitchen. And uh, he is the creator, if you do not know, of 2600 games such as Crackpots, Ghostbusters, Kung Fu Master, F-14 Tomcat, Crossbow, River Raid 2, Double Dragon, and Akari Warriors. Yes. And that's just for the 2600. So, we thought we'd talk to you a little bit about uh, some of your upcoming homebrew games. And um, so tell me a little bit about your discovery, yes. your rediscovery. My rediscovery. Of uh, what was known as Keystone Capers 2 back uh, yes. when it was uh, possibly being released under the Activision uh, label. Yes. Well, I had, uh, after Crackpots, Gary had created Keystone Capers and then I had released Crackpots. Yeah. And I was always enthralled with railroads and wanted to do a railroad themed game. Yeah. And created a display with beautiful desert and some freight cars. And Gary and I looked at it and said, hey, why don't you put Keystone Kelly up there? Mm. You know, maybe he leaves the department store and he comes to the West, <laughs> retires, yeah. and he's a conductor in a train. Yeah. So I put Keystone Kelly in and uh, started developing the game and then started coding the gameplay and all of a sudden the 1983 crash happened yeah. and Activision pulled us off our current in-progress games and put us on other titles, right. specifically for the Commodore and for the other platforms. So I made a ROM of this and I put it away, I thought, somewhere I could find it and disappeared. Yeah. And for many, many years, I would see the people at the Classic Gaming Convention and tell them, I have this ROM somewhere of Keystone Capers 2. Yeah. And after about 20 years of saying that, they all said, sure, Dan. <laughs> We're sure yeah. you do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> prove it. Prove right? it. Yeah. And about six months ago, I stumbled upon a tool to start writing 2600 games and thought I should create the Keystone Capers that I knew I once had. Okay. So you, so you started developing it again before you found, found, the, found the cart. And it inspired me to go into the darkness of my off-site with Carolyn on a sunny, humid afternoon in June yeah. and say, I'm going to go through, look at some of my old games and see what I can find. Yeah. And I had on the development of the new game, I had the display up. Yeah. I had the mountains up, a new desert. I had new train cars. So I, I wrote the game as I had done in 1983 in yeah. pure 6502. Wasn't intending any ARM chips or any other supporting hardware. Yeah. And lo and behold, I find the cartridge. So excited, yeah. immediately took a photo of it yeah. and sent it to my dear friend John Hardy at the National Video Game Museum, who was in fact one of the guys I told about this for 20 years. <laughs> now you have the proof. Well, John <laughs> happened to be in the New York area visiting his, his stepfather yeah. and arranged to come to my, my flat the next day to see the game in person. In person, yeah. And he came in and he was amazed that we, Dan, you actually had this. Yeah. Uh, we thought you were telling stories for the last 10 years. <laughs> we believed you for 10 years and then, yeah. so we plugged it in and it came right up. We were yeah. very excited. Oh yeah. I could run Keystone Kelly around. Yeah. And shortly after that, we went to Dallas for the Let's Play Game Expo, yeah. where I brought the cartridge and did a little video in their museum, which I think made yeah. the internet. Yeah and uh, sent you some pictures, I believe. Yep. And then I donated it to the museum. Wonderful. Which was wonderful for John. He was very happy to have that. So that everybody can see it. If they want to go there and take a look at the actual cartridge and read a little bit about it, that's, that's amazing. And I, I, I am planning to release the code for that, the cartridge ROM, after I release Gold Rush. Yep. And so I, I continue to progress on this train game and um, for obvious reasons of uh, licensing, I did not want to use the Keystone name. Yeah. I didn't have rights to Keystone Kelly. Yeah. So I changed it to Casey O'Kelly, yeah. which is Keystone's long lost cousin, yeah. who was out in the West. And I hope Keystone will visit someday and make a, make a trip to see him. And uh, I've continued to create this and will be releasing it uh, early 2019, and I believe based on the input I've gotten, I'm gonna do a Kickstarter campaign mm. so I can accumulate the interest that's out there and get yeah. some interest in my, my pre-orders so that I can set up manufacturing correctly. And, and so you'll know how big of a run you need to do. How big of a run I need, uh, what the interest level is, yeah. and I, I hope to uh, build a line of new games uh, based upon my name 
I have a second one in the works, which I think I have mentioned to you. That's right, yeah. Um, which I hope to show you a little bit of in development. Yeah. Uh, bon Voyage. Yes. Where uh, I was kind of inspired by playing Sequest and Barnstorming and thought to myself, actually sitting in a tiki bar in California one evening, what title would I have created in 1983 that fell into the beautiful view of an Activision game with a catchy name and something I could do very appealing generic artwork with? Yeah. And I thought, you know, I read something on the Titanic earlier that day and I thought, well, how about doing an ocean liner going horizontally through the North Atlantic with icebergs that you've got to avoid and rescuing swimmers that were people coming from a shipwreck. And it all kind of came together in a second. Yeah. I went back that evening to my hotel, I wrote the initial kernel, uh, and lo and behold, Bon Voyage was born. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, so you said you had the cartridge of Keystone Capers too. Um, I know that it, Activision was very pro developers and getting people's names out over top of the Activision name or alongside the Activision name. Um, was that a regular thing where people would, um, you know, kind of develop it personally and have all these um, cartridges at their houses or, you know, they would have them on their person? So is it possible that more um, people would have, you know, long lost games out there? No, we, we pretty much kept very tight control of the cartridges that we created for the unreleased games. Uh, the lab was secure, you couldn't get into it without a pass key. Um, they were very concerned about game espionage at the time. Although we were in the Eastern Center in New Jersey, so we didn't really have to worry about too much espionage. Um, <laughs> but this was a cartridge I made that I kept in the lab and must have years later when we left Activision to form Absolute Entertainment, I must have taken it with me. Uh, the 2600 was history at that point and not anything anyone cared about. Uh, There's actually a, another game that I created to completion there mm. that I hope to one day find. Yeah. Um, but we didn't necessarily carry them around with us or we had the ability to work at home okay. and access through what's called a leased line, our PDP-11 computer in the office, oh. which was literally the process of the phone company running a hard wire from the office through the telephone poles to your house. Yep. So you could connect with the PDP-11. And I have to tell you that was an arduous task because programming on that, you would hit a keystroke and wait a few seconds for the response to come back. <laughs> so if I had assembled a 4K game at home, it would probably take me in 45 minutes till it was done. Uh. So, uh, but we did work at home fortunately at that time, but we really kept everything in the lab. Coming back to programming, uh, games again yes. for the 2600 and um, kind of now getting into of course what is now the homebrew scene yes. because you know there aren't big um, companies releasing games for the 2600 anymore that's long lost how how did you um, were you aware of the homebrew scene or how did you discover it or rediscover it or were you always aware that people were making new games for the for the 2600? Yeah. You know, I wasn't aware of it. I, I spent much of my l career in the last 10 years working on iPhone titles, uh, developing games for uh, advertising companies, branding games for for packaged goods companies like Nabisco and Hellman's Mayonnaise and, and doing work for online free-to-play games with Zenga and other companies. I was unaware there was a homebrew uh, business or homebrew market at all or people were creating these games yeah. until I happened to turn on Twitch and saw Zero Page Homebrew. And that was the first really? time I said, wow, people are doing homebrew. <laughs> and you introduced me to all these great games some of which are fascinating and very beautiful. If these people had been around during the 83, they would have certainly sat next to me at Activision. They would have cleaned up. And like. been some of our best designers. Uh, and that's the first time I realized and learned that people were doing homebrew back to 2000 and the late 90s, which was very exciting for me because the Atari 2600 I was the second platform I developed games for before which after the Apple II, okay. when I did a number of games in the early 1980. And I loved the system, loved the challenge, and I was so excited that there may be a place for me to continue to write games for it. And I think you're in a unique position right now because I'm, I'm not aware of any 
programmers that used to program back in the 80s and 90s for the Atari 2600 that have now come back around and are now programming again in the homebrew scene. I can't think of another person that is in that position. Um, are you aware of one? And, and how has the reception been coming back into programming 2600? How has the community uh, embraced you? I, I believe that Rob Fulop may have done one title. I think he finished a title he had started out of Magic. Um, and that was maybe four or five years ago. I, I don't know of any other. I seem to be currently the only original 2600 developer that has come back to the homebrew scene. I, I've had a wonderfully warm reception from everyone. Um, they're excited to see my new game. I was overjoyed to see that some of my old games are still played by the community, which I was very happy with. Um, and I'm just excited to be a part of it. And hopefully when my game is released and I release the, the ROM code, that people can look at it and hopefully learn some of the tricks we had at Activision to improve the homebrew business. Because I think as we help each other, we'll just make a better games for players to play. And I'm very, very interested in helping other homebrew developers to bring their games up to the best quality they can. Looking at the aesthetic of your games that you're making now, uh, Gold Rush and Bon Voyage, uh, which I haven't seen Bon Voyage, but I'm guessing it'll be the same kind of aesthetic from the description you've told me, of um, uh, Activision games and the colorfulness of, it, of them and you know the sunsets and and also you know the the sticking to the non flicker mm -hmm. and also there's no lines on the left hand side of the screen mm -hmm. um, is is that something that you're um, consciously doing or you're just a continuation of what you did before um, and just with the aesthetic and the look of it is just something you like uh, the look of well it's certainly something I like but I was trained at Activision to make the cleanest screen. I remember when, when we were doing games, we would sit for hours, and if we saw a little flicker on the screen or a timing glitch where something wasn't stored at the right cycle, we would do everything we could to fix that problem or remove the object. We were very much uh, kept on creating the cleanest games. So I consciously, through the development of what will now be Gold Rush, have been cognizant of keeping the the black border, the HMOVE border down the screen to make it clean and to also have a place for the sprites, the players to, to hide behind. Um, I have been conscious about using colors. Uh, they're all single line kernels. I'm writing the entire thing in 6502, just as I would do at Activision. Uh, no external hardware, no, no help with anything, no extra RAM. And uh, I'm cognizant to create it as if I was sitting in the Activision lab in 1983. Um, and that leads me to my next question: Is the like the development of these these new games in comparison in comparison to how you did program them um, back in the '80s and '90s, and comparing them how you program them now with um, the new tools? Are, are you taking advantage of any um, new development tools, or is it just you're typing straight code into a text editor and hitting compile? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm typing straight code into into a text editor. <laughs> and I'm using DASM to assemble the code. And Stella you know, to run it. And Stella to run it on the screen, which is wonderful. In the old days, we had a blue box with four 8K RAM. We would download and had a Stella unit actually on the top of the box and be able to grab the joystick and connect it to a television and check our builds out then. Our blue box was a piece of hardware that was dedicated, designed by Al and Dave Crane. Uh, I'm sorry, by Bob Whitehead and Dave Crane, and we had breakpoints. We could do single step trace. We could do, uh, we could download the labels. So we had very, they were somewhat primitive debugging. Um, but no, I'm, I'm just not focused on any new tools. I'm using graph paper to do my sprites, to do my players, and then I'm coding it in with the hexadecimal numbers, seeing how it looks on the screen, making the changes. Um, I'm actually using less tools than we used back then. Because right. I, I had written a, a custom Activision uh, pixel player editor, which I used for Kung Fu Master, where I could put in the pixels in playfield chunks 
they would show up in the player next to it, and then on each line I could change the color, I could change the new size to copy it, I could H move each individual for magnify and shift, and that's actually what I used to develop the magnified shift, shifted players in Kung Fu Master. Mm -hmm. And I do not have the luxury of that tool now, so I'm kind of doing it with the best I can on graph paper and then figuring out the numbers and typing them right in. Yeah. And, and do you have actual hardware that you're running it on as well? Do you have like a Harmony cart or are you just developing and trying it out in Stella right now? Are you, are you planning to get one if you don't have one? I I've actually have a Harmony cart and a Retron 77 and a Heavy Sixer. So I, in addition to making things on Stella, I will burn ROMs. Uh, or flash ROMs, as it were, as it were, yeah. and put them into the Stella to make sure that they work properly. Oh, cool. um, my brother and I always had a philosophy where, at the end of every night, get the cleanest build you can. <laughs> so if I'm working during the day and I've got some things on the screen I'm not happy with, I'll stay to the, up to the wee hours to make sure the next day I have a very clean build to work from. And almost every night I'll, I'll flash it into the Harmony, plug it into the Stella and make sure it looks right and it plays well. Yeah, it's nice to go to sleep. Knowing that yes. you know there's a build that's working. Yes, I don't have that bug <laughs> nagging me in the back of my it's head. Like, oh, I couldn't get that. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about um, your new company. Yes, that you're releasing the 2600 games under. Yes, um, Tiki Vision. I've always been a, a, a very much an aficionado of everything Polynesian. <laughs> I love tiki bars. I love Hawaii. I love Tahiti. And uh, in 2009, I. Uh, created a company called Tiki Interactive, where I did a number of iPhone titles, did a lot of work for clients under that brand, and I still use that brand when doing artwork for Zynga and Pocket Gems and other, other people. I actually have a studio in India that I own that does this free-to-play artwork and some of these iOS development projects. Uh, and Tiki Vision is, is something I thought as an homage to Activision that if I publish new games for the 2600, let me try making a new brand called Tiki Vision. And I actually, at the bottom of the screen, I've got Tiki Vision with a little Tiki head, a little Tiki blue, a brown and white head. Um, and uh, I'm actually also creating a series of board games that will come out next year, the first one in Q1, and that is under the name Tabletop Tiki. Oh, and so it all ties into it all Tiki. Ties to Tiki, yes. Yeah. It all ties uh, to uh, to my love of, of uh, Polynesian and everything Hawaiian. You touched on this briefly um, with your new game, Gold Rush. Um, you've been able to incorporate some of your interests and, yes. and history with the with the trains. Maybe you can discuss a little bit more about that. Little elements that you're putting in. Um, to the first game you're putting out, uh, Gold Rush. Yes, well, I've always loved railroading. Um, I used to be actually a member of the oldest model railroad club in America that is based in New Jersey. Um, through my engineering background, I did a lot of the work there for their computer control systems. And I've always loved the idea of miniatures and railroading. So that's what inspired me initially to do Keystone Capers 2. Uh, and now since I am re-releasing it or, or recreating it for a new game, I wanted to keep the theme of railroading. Uh, I've also at times in my life done uh, with, with my brother and my dad, we were all sort of amateur magicians. Mm. And uh, Gary and I have often at parties and whatnot done some magic work. Uh, I did a game actually with uh, Blackstone for Nabisco at one point back in the early 90s. Um, I was the producer of Penn & Teller Smoke and Mirrors, which is an underground game that I think people know of via Desert Bus, right. which was one of the games I produced with Penn & Teller. Yeah, Desert Bus is very well known. Very well known. Mar Marathon games are based on that for fundraising, and yes. it's wonderful. Very happy to see that it's gone over to the charity and to help raise money for needs that are important. And so in Gold Rush, I have the, obviously the train theme, uh, and the train cars uh, in the game take on some themes. I have some circus cars. Yeah. I have some magic cars. Yeah. Because back in the old days, people like Blackstone Sr. would travel from town to town with very long freight cars yeah. with their magic show. Yeah. Um, and I, in Gold Rush, I have about 25 trains currently, 25 levels yeah. of varying lengths of trains. Right. And the main goal of the game is to collect all of the gold that has been 
taken from the gold car and scattered around the train, and then return it to the gold car, and then make your way to the locomotive and stop the train in time. Do you have a limit of how many gold pieces you can pick up? Do you have to go back and forth or you just collect them along the, along the way? I do have a limit. Yeah. And when you get back into the freight area, you can actually go into the cars themselves. So it's like a two separate stage Correct. kind of thing. You drop into the car, screen changes, now you're inside the car. I still retain the little bumping of the track. Oh, and in there yeah. you've got gold bars stacked up that you have to replace. Okay. And in many of the cars that are the same type of obstacles or different obstacles you may have yeah. from what's on top of the train. Yeah. So in the magic cars, I have bunnies popping out of <laughs> top hats. Nice. I have dancing canes, floating balls. Yeah. Uh, on the circus train, I have giraffes that are in the cars. I have elephants. I have circus performers that are flipping and doing various things. It's a lot of variety. I have actually, I think at this point, about 50 plus enemies or obstacles, which uh, I will be creating a set of trading cards for, for each unique one. And it sounds like they're not just uh, a sprite swap. It sounds like they do have different movements and different ways you have to avoid them. Oh yes, everyone has a different AI. Um, fortunately, in this time period, we have the ability to create larger games. Yes. Whereas in the old days, we were manufacturing them and the publisher would come to you and say, please create the game in the smallest configuration. Because it would be cheaper. It's like, you're making cheaper. a four or That's an right. eight. It depends how much they wanted to, you know, price it out for in the stores. Depends what time they wanted, the, right, the price point they wanted to achieve and how much they wanted the, the manufacturing cost to be. Now, fortunately, we have free reign for the ROM space. And so I can go to 16K or 32K if I need to. Currently, I'll be at 16, but I'm still restricted by 128 bytes of RAM. So in this game... Because you're, you're doing it clean, you're doing, doing it old clean. school. And in this game, I've just about dug every bit. I mean, I have some bytes that have six or eight bits that I'm using for data. Uh, I know that I remember Dave doing Pitfall, used the polynomial to yep. generate the backgrounds yep. and had a bit for every part of the screen. Yep. And in many cases, in Gold Rush, I'm doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, that sounds amazing. So you're still kind of in mid, early to mid development of your um, second game, a uh, homebrew game, Bon Voyage. As I mentioned, I was sitting at a tiki bar in California, yeah. thinking hard about what next game could I do, and I don't want to do something I previously played with, but I wanted to do something that I could see uh, Activision put out. One yeah. of my favorite designers is Steve Cartwright. Steve and I are good friends, and Steve's games, I think, were some of the most beautiful, mm -hmm. from Barnstorming to Sequest, oh, yeah. um, and uh, Frostbite. Oh, yeah. And I love the, 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 the ideas and the genres he came up with. So I thought, geez, what would be a Steve Cartwright type of Activision game? And I mentioned I was reading something earlier in the day about the Titanic, and I thought instantly, ah, oh, I can see the white line style poster that they used to have of a beautiful luxury liner, and it's kind of old school, 30s, 40s, vintage. And I immediately thought, ah, oh, let's, let's pilot a liner through the ocean and you have to avoid icebergs. Yeah. And then later in the game, you may have to avoid some interesting characters, maybe a Loch Ness monster, a <laughs> Kraken, uh, uh, some other various rocks, and, and let's have something they can collect. And so I thought, well, Steve used divers. So maybe I'll have little characters that are little people and they're done, created using the ball yeah. in, in, in the system. Yeah. And in each lane you have swimmers that you can you can acquire and so I'm thinking of it as more a ship that was sent to the site of the Titanic okay. to rescue those who were in the water. So not necessarily the Titanic itself. Correct okay. and I think I'm actually going to put the Titanic up in the beautiful sunset I have uh, on the ocean as pieces of it kind of slowly sinking and that's kind of the overall timer. Um, okay. That could be the timer of the game, although I do have a, a, a kernel at the bottom that uses our energy bar, mm -hmm. not unlike what we used in Mega Mania and Sequest, yep. yes. and yes. there's a little luxury liner that moves across there mm -hmm. as it changes color to show you where the end of the game, where the end of the level is. Yeah, because when you first described or talked about it, I was thinking, oh, you are the Titanic, and you're trying to get across the ocean, and trying to rewrite history almost <laughs> and avoid the uh, icebergs and stuff, but nope, 
it's going to sink no matter it's what. Gonna sink. That was my <laughs> initial thought is, gee, I guess I'm the Titanic. But then when I started putting in the characters and the players for the uh, objects and for the swimmers, I thought, it doesn't really make sense. I think I think you're, you're there as one of the ships. I think the Carpathia was the one that was closest to the sinking that right. made it as as close as quickly as possible to the to the site and started to pick up survivors. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense because it just it wasn't it wasn't working in my mind either. So yes, it wasn't working in my yeah, mind. Yeah, so rescuing and and kind of you know rescuing the people that have went overboard and yes. needed rescuing. Yeah. Yes. And there's still, you know, icebergs in that area because that's what they hit. Icebergs and, and the game starts you you leave one port yeah. and then you eventually go through some waters with rocks and mm. some some various shoals. And then you get out into the North Atlantic and the background at the sunset changes from, from green and from mountainous uh, green areas to icebergs and ice shelves as that start to come by. And then the icebergs begin to populate the, each lane. Yeah. And you, have, you can accelerate the ship to be able to get the characters before they, they drown, unfortunately, right. before they disappear. So they'll be like sinking or some kind of indicator showing that, oh, that guy's turning color or something. Yes. Yeah, they're actually swimming, and then they stop every now and then and take their hand and, and signal and raise. Oh, wow. And then they start swimming again, and you've got to get them before they go under too many times. Oh, I can't wait to see the, the graphics using the ball. Using the ball. <laughs> I, you know, I'm a big fan of using the ball and doing the shift and magnify and reposition of it. Yeah. And I love the things that Steve did with Sequest and other people have done. And so I, I obviously can't use a player because I've got the yeah. ship is created from Playfield and a player. Oh, with yeah. magnify and shift all the way down. Yeah. So it looks very beautiful. It's got a blue hull with a red line by the sea, uh, and it's got waves on it that animate. And I've got smokestacks with beautiful waves, uh, beautiful smoke that comes out and gets stretched across the screen. Yeah. Uh, and then I have the icebergs that come in various uh, forms, yeah. two, three, spaced yeah. apart differently. There yeah. may be a, a little chap in between two of them. You've got to kind of sail and come down and get grab him and then get away out of that lane before the iceberg hits you. Yeah. Uh, and oh, yeah, be, being clever with the play field yes. and, the, and the players and the ball, you can get a lot in on a line. I can. I can get a lot in on the line. And then when you successfully finish the level, you pull into another port where I have fireworks that are bursting in the, in the sky wow. that kind of give a very nice reward to the player. Uh, and then you go back, and, and I believe I'm going to put in a change of time, change of day. Yeah. So you may have some night versions where you see lights on the liner, and right. some oh. some a moon up with some glow on the water. Yeah, give it a little bit more difficulty because you can't Correct. quite see where you're going. And Correct. And that's where you may see some interesting things coming out of the water, yeah. perhaps some tentacles, perhaps <laughs> a kraken. Reaching up yes. and grabbing you. Yes, yes, yeah. perhaps some. Or grabbing the swimmers. Or grabbing the swimmers, that's yeah. exactly right that you have to combat. And each time you acquire a swimmer at the bottom display, I have six life vests, or actually okay. life preservers yes. that appear that look like lifesavers that are yellow, I'm sorry, that are white and red. Yeah. And you accumulate six of those. And then I'm actually playing now with, with having a, a second ship that comes by that, that will take the swimmers from you. Okay. So that you can now get those extra points, not unlike yeah. in Sequest, you yes, make it to the surface. And That's right. Doot, 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 doot. You yeah, get drop off the drop the off diamond. those, and you go back down. Yeah. So in this, I think I'm going to have a little uh, another ship, as it was in the convoy, yeah. that comes up to yours. You connect with boom, 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 boom. The swimmers are off safely. They go back to Pier 98, where they should have landed <laughs> in New York, yeah. I think it was. Yeah. And then you can go and rescue more. That's that's amazing. I can't wait to see it. Um, so it sounds because you are setting up your own company, you know, Tiki Vision, to release the 2600 homebrews under. Yes. Um, it sounds like you do have plans um, to continue on and making games um, beyond these two. Yes. Uh, I yeah. So um, you probably don't. I don't know if you have ideas brewing or anything like that. Or you know, uh, the way I work is if if I get struck with a concept, I'll usually stop what I'm doing and sit down and do a 20, 30 hour push and yeah. write the display kernel and see yeah. if my ideas that are in my mind can be created on the system. Yeah. Sometimes they don't look as good and I'll scrap that. Yeah. And sometimes as with Bon Voyage, I put them up and Im immediately thought of some new tricks to do and 
boy, it looks better than I imagined. Um, oh, yeah. But I do have uh, the second uh, and the third and fourth games, and I'm hoping to release probably two every quarter. Two but, every quarter? Yes, yeah, so wow. I'm hoping to do two uh, in the first quarter of 19, and then two in the second quarter. Wow. Uh, That's one, ambitious. One at the middle and one at the end. Well, you're well versed in creating games for the 2600, so uh, you'd definitely be able to do that. Well, it's, it's, you know, even in the last 30 years when I wasn't doing 2600 games, I would often stop and think about what would I be doing on the 2600 if I could? <laughs> and I've then, since seeing the homebrew games and the amazing work people are doing, it's, it has inspired me to go back to those thoughts and say, well, now I actually have an outlet to do it. Uh, let me bring back some of the games I've conceived of in the last 20 years, and now I can actually do them. And it's very exciting for me, because I loved working on the machine, I love the challenge, and it's, uh, I love getting back into real programming, which I consider real programming in the assembler, 6502, yep. as opposed to the iOS work I've done in C++, and in Phaser, and a number of other tools, and Unity. I'm very happy to get back to my roots. Yeah. So these, these first two games you are doing in, in pure assembly, no help from an extra uh, processor. Are you thinking about looking into that or are you going to stick with um, the pure assembly right on the, running on the 6507? Uh, I'm going to stick with pure 6502 assembly without any additional help. I, I, I love what people are doing with the new hardware. It makes the games much more brilliant much more uh, complicated and involved for the players. I think it's great that the players can play these games that are much more involved. But as a purist designer, I love the challenge of only staying with the initial Stella hardware. So I'm going to be sticking there. Yeah, because I know there is a lot of respect for people who do stick to the and are purists and run just 6502 straight. And um, I know it's the ports. You you probably do need to do a lot of extra processing power for some of these arcade ports. But when you're doing homebrew and making your own games, you're able to fit them in and work with what you're given on the Atari 2600. So that's probably you know why maybe you're going that route. And it's what you know and what you're really, really good at. Right, uh, you know, I, I did my fill of ports with Kung Fu Master, with Crossbow. Um, which, are, which are beautiful, especially like Kung Fu Master and I know that um, Double Dragon is brought up for the, the graphics outside yeah. of the play field above them yeah. as an example of amazing, beautiful graphics done with just uh, the basics of the 2600. Thank you. And, and I worked with uh, Dave closely on the Ghostbusters yeah. since he had created the C64 original version. Which is a great version. Which yeah. is a great version. When I did Kung Fu Master, I had the arcade system and the Nintendo version in my office to look at and try to recreate as closely as I could the colors and the graphics. And that's a great port too as well, with the, because you're able to take advantage of the triplication. Yes, yeah. I was. Crossbow, I, I put in as much as I could. Yeah. It was a, a, tough a tough one, very detailed. But obviously with the homebrew, I, I, I don't want to do games that I haven't officially licensed. Right. I respect the IP holders and, and don't want to create games that I'm not, not, not able to, or not allowed to. Uh, and so it, it also gives me the chance to be creative and obviously when you're creating your original game, yeah. you don't have to worry about those restrictions. Yeah. And a lot, and a lot of um, Activision games were original games and, and very creative games as well. Yes, and initially they gave us free reign and they, they pretty much always did, it was instead of a market driven company where marketing would come and say we need the following game, they would leave us alone and say, develop the best game you can that's original, tell us what it is, and we'll create the marketing program around you. Mm -hmm. And that was, that's how we, we started in the business and stayed in the business. Yeah. Well, that's all very exciting. Thank you. <laughs> and, and I can't wait to uh, see these games and play these games that are coming out. Wonderful. And yeah, Thank and you. I'm, I'm hoping Zero Page will have them on there. And oh, definitely. I'm hoping you can personally help me with some of the uh, testing. Oh, That'd I definitely will. And, and show everybody out there um, uh, the games as they develop and, uh, and give news to the people um, when they're ready for release and then they can come and pick them up. What very good. And, and one, one more thing is um, I am putting Easter eggs into them. Uh, and in some of the cases, you may see some of our old Activision friends. Keystone, oh, nice. uh, Keystone Kelly may be in one of the coach cars. Yep. I think sitting along with Pitfall Harry. 
and a few other uh, characters that you may recognize from the old Activision days. We'll, uh, we'll be making a, a trip through the desert, I think. Oh, that'll be lots of fun for people to hunt around. Easter eggs are fun. Yeah, it's always a, it's an homage I do to the fellow designers I worked with. So thank you very much thank you. for the interview. It thank was you, wonderful, James. and I'm really looking forward to these games Thank you so coming much out. For, for helping support them. Yeah, no problem. Thank you.